So this is an opportunity for everyone today to get equipped with some capacity building. And what we're going to be focusing on once again is motivating your team. Um, and so let's get the, the party started, but I'm going to actually introduce our first uh, of uh, two coordinating council members. So if you're not familiar with STMFC's coordinating council, uh, they are a leadership body at STMFC. And so uh, Ms. Claudine Casillas from KPBS will be sharing a little welcome for you all. Claudine. Oh, good morning and happy Tuesday, everyone. Um, thank you, Danny. Yes, I'm Claudine Casillas. I'm with KPBS. And um, many of you may know me because of the work I do with the GI Film Festival San Diego. But I also serve as your coordinating council member for the SDMFC, along with Jennifer Santis, who you'll hear from shortly. Um, and we're very excited to be kicking things off today with our very first members only training for 2023, all about motivating teams. Um, earlier in when during when we were enjoying the music, we threw in a link to sign in. So please make sure you go ahead and sign in so we know that you're here and that you're present. Um, but most importantly, we want to say thank you. Um, SDMFC is built on strengthened by its members, organizations, agencies, and individuals just like you and you who share a common um, value, vision, and goal for our community and strengthening our military families. So thank you for being here. The SDMFC is based on the power of collective impact, and every person can contribute to our success, um, you most importantly as our members. So thank you again for being here with us this morning. Next slide, Danny. Just as a reminder, as a member of SDMFC, you can actualize special benefits which include capacity training meetings like this one, networking opportunities. Um, members also receive recognition on the SDMFC website, special rates for the annual summit in the fall, and messaging, prioritizing messaging in our online newsletters, social media, and community calendar. I think the next slide will give you a sneak peek of what some of that looks like. Um, go ahead and change that screen, Danny. Thank you. So there you go. That's um, some of the member only benefits that we offer to all of our um, supporters and partners as part of the collaborative. As mentioned before, today's training is training is all about motivating teams. Um, we know during the pandemic um, teams and workplaces kind of got shuffled around. Um, not just in the remote work, but the actual people um, you may have experienced in your or your own organization, um, new hires, maybe some layoffs, um, and other departures, early retirement, or people just pursuing um, new passions and new career opportunities. But all of that, all of those changes contribute to a team's motivation and success. Um, so we're hoping that this training is going to cover some new insights um, for motivating your team. Um, next slide, Danny. Um, very shortly, we're going to do a little breakout exercise to get you in the mindset of um, today's training and um, identifying what are the key motivations for um, teams. During the training, we're going to ask that you be an active participant ask questions, you'll have opportunities to share your perspective and be willing to hear um, from others around the Zoom room and from our esteemed guest. So to get things started, we're gonna do a three to five minute um, breakout room activity. You're going to introduce yourself and your organization, and then you're gonna share any tips or successes you've had personally experienced around motivating your team. Maybe you've been the one being motivated and something worked really well for you, or maybe you've been the one who's been um, providing that motivation to a team member. So we wanna know what works. And then if anything has changed in terms of motivating factors for your teams um, during the pandemic, share that as well. All right, Danny, we're ready for our breakout. All right, so momentarily you will see on your screen there's a breakout room. You'll be in a room with, uh, let's keep it quaint today, so three to four individuals. Um, and I just advise maybe take a picture of what the screen uh, question looks like or else I will be sending a message via the broadcast or uh, the written form. So you'll see that at the top of your breakout room. But breakout rooms will open shortly. So see you in three to five minutes.
All right, that should be everyone. So you take it away, team. All right, welcome back, everyone. I'm Jennifer Santis. Thank you for being here. I hope you enjoyed our brief breakout session. Um, we'd love for you to share uh, any of the takeaways that you may have from the uh, networking opportunity and share them in the chat if you would. Uh, today, I am really excited. It's our first um, members only training. Um, the theme of the year is Connect and Cultivate. And uh, I wanted to uh, introduce our presenter. His name is Dr. Barba, uh, Dr. Doug, Doug Barba. And um, he is a psychologist, sports psychologist. And he is the academic director of, um, let me get this right, the master's program at performance psychology program at National University. Um, his areas of expertise are sports and exercise psychology. He is, um, let's see, has served as a, an adjunct faculty member at San Diego State University for 12 years. He's also uh, served on several collegiate uh, athletic teams, including University of Florida, Gators, and before his academic career, he also was a professional baseball player at one time. So I'm really excited that he's here today with us. And I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Barb, Dr. Doug Barba. <laughs> I think we are on mute. We're gonna have to get you to unmute, Dr. Barba. Are you able to unmute? Nope. Let's see if I can. There it goes. And we are screen sharing and I have unmuted. I apologize for the delay. I didn't know which screen I was on at the time. So um, my name is Doug Barba. I am a uh, sport and performance psychologist here at National University. I've been here over a dozen years. Before that, um, I was at San Diego State. And before that, I was at University of Florida and everywhere in between. So, um, one thing I'd like to set the groundwork, you know, uh, kind of moving forward. If you have questions, go ahead and ask. Um, you don't have to wait. Um, for me, the value for you will be our discussion, not me talking at you. Um, and so I would appreciate if you have a question, raise your hand, put it in the thing, uh, feel free to interrupt me. Um, I think we'll get more out of it by the exchange of ideas as opposed to me talking at you. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, so the, the reality is to me, let's talk about Is anyone else having audio issues? Dr. Barber, you, you're breaking in and out. Oh, I wonder if I'm having trouble pushing the video. Uh, but does it, am I clearer now? Yeah, you're, you're clearer now. Okay. Yeah, it was the choppy video, for me, Ron. Yeah, my apologies. The, the first video, the first slide had video in it and that might've been more than my uh, computer was uh, able to push. Um, okay, so for, for this topic, um, when you talk about motivating a team, I, I think of motivation and I also think about leadership. Um, there is an interaction of the, the environment and all the corresponding individuals in that environment, whether it's gonna be successful or not, whether you're gonna to wanna to come back or not, whether you're gonna to wanna to participate at a higher level or not. And so it's really important not just to pay attention to uh, the leader, not just to pay attention to the workers, not just to pay attention to the environment, but all of them at once and how they interact with each other. So, you know, why, why people are moved into uh, action is essentially at the heart of motivation. What energizes us, what directs us, 
what we pick to involve ourselves in and participate in. Um, and, you know, sport is a great kind of petri dish for this uh, because it gives you a chance to try different things. And so that's where a lot of the literature that I have been privy to over the last 30 years kind of comes from. Um, but there's also a lot of in, uh, literature on leadership, obviously, and industrial organizational stuff, uh, and so more business settings. And so I've kind of pulled from all of that. Um, but the whole thing about motivation, it's going to relate to how much energy you're willing to commit to things. Um, it's going to uh, play a role in how you're going to deal with success and failure. Uh, how you're able to overcome obstacles, and basically how much work you're willing to put in. And so motivation is very important, um, but it's only one piece of the pie. Okay, the primary theory that I look at, and, and don't get lost with this stuff, um, I can send you out the slides, that's not a problem. You know, I'm an academic, so when I talk about things, I think I, I have to throw stuff at you to see. Um, but when I think about motivation and leadership, I'm drawn to self-determination theory. And what's convenient about this is this is what I did my dissertation on. So um, having an understanding of it has kind of proved fruitful for me for a long time. Historically, um, when we thought about motivation before like the early 1980s or 1970s, it was kind of more of a Watson Skinner approach. It's like what you reinforced is what happened more often. What you didn't reinforce went away. What they found, uh, Desi and Ryan, it was at, at a lab at the University of Rochester. Um, they had people figuring out puzzles. They timed them how long they took the puzzle. Um, they reinforced them different ways. People got extrinsic reinforcement like cash and other people just got better at it. What they found just kind of as, you know, it wasn't even part of the research. Um, one of the settings, uh, they were videotaping the people and then after the session ended, they kept the video going and they noticed who continued on the activity and who stopped on the activity. The people that were reinforced externally by payment stopped the activity. So this puzzle that they were asked, they were charged to put together, um, if they were paid to do it, when the pay went away, the work on the puzzle stopped. The ones in the group where they were just trying to get better or develop skills at the puzzle, when uh, the session stopped, they continued to manipulate the puzzle. They still wanted to get better at the puzzle. And so this was really the first indication that extrinsic or external feedback or uh, reinforcement can get in the way of behavior and motivation. And, and this was uh, counter to what everybody else had found in the field. Uh, their initial work was in the early 70s. And then in 1985, Desi and Wright came out with a textbook uh, looking at intrinsic motivation and self-determination theory. Um, as part of that, extensions of it, uh, people have looked at leadership looking to improve the basic psychological needs that Desi and Ryan identified, which were autonomy, right? So our ability to select and initiate the behaviors or things that we wanted to do. When we were in control of what we want to do, we're going to do it more often. The, the second one was confidence, and I'm not sure why I have them uh, out of order here, uh, but confidence was we want to be good in our environment. We want to be successful. We want people to know that, you know, given the opportunity, I'm going to see the job through. Uh, the last one is relatedness. We all want to be part of a community. We want to be, we want to have a place to go where we fit in. We want to be with our people. Uh, when my oldest son was in high school, uh, for a long time, we, we weren't sure where he, you know, where he fit in. Uh, when he was up on stage in theater, he lit up. It was like, oh, my God, he's found his people. Uh, actually, my younger brother said that to me after the show. Um, he was supposed to be a backup for somebody that was sick. He went on stage. He's ad living. He lights up. It's just like, oh, my gosh, this is what he does. Um, and now this is kind of, he's, uh, he's an actor in New York, uh, he's going on to school, but 
Uh, so, it, you know, finding a place, a group where you're fulfilled, you see yourself as an integral part of it goes a long way. It makes us feel good. Um, I think in all our breakout groups, and, you know, part of what we missed over the COVID years was just being with people, being part of a group where, you know, we can feel valued. Uh, later on, uh, another sport and performance uh, group uh, out of uh, Canada uh, extended the, the, the ideas of Desi and Ryan. And what they said is leadership that supports autonomy. A leader that kind of lets you, uh, one of our, uh, in our breakout room, somebody mentioned micromanaging. Um, how many of you have worked under somebody that micromanaged your work? That doesn't feel good, does it? They're always looking over your shoulder. You feel like they're waiting for you to make a mistake, you know, all of that. So it, it gets in the way of your feeling like you're able to control your own destiny and pick and choose the activities you choose, you do. And so what they essentially said, is that if you have leadership behavior that increases feelings of autonomy, confidence, and relatedness, they're going to be more effective. Your, your employees, your athletes are going to be more resilient, more intrinsically motivated, more self-starter, more curious. They're going to be more engaged. And so that's kind of the focus. Um, more leadership theoretical stuff. Uh, the biggest thing here I want you to pay attention to, and I've kind of touched on this already, um, is that it's not just the leader's behavior. It's not just the, the employee or the worker's behavior or the situation. It's all of them combined. And so, you know, every time you go into a scenario, if the leader's the same and the group's the same, it's not always going to be the same if the uh, situation or the environment's different. Um, you see that in a lot of performing situations where I, I hear a lot of coaches say that's not the way they did it in practice. Um, and it's like, well, coach, that's because practice is different than competition. And you need to kind of how can you make your competition? I mean, your practice more like competition and then maybe the uh, behavioral transfer. And um, I've also seen this on the leadership side in business where you will talk to a leader and they will tell you all the right things and do all the, you know, say all the right words in front of you. But when they get in front of their group, um, sometimes they're kind of their themes uh, change, the things they're pushing changes. And so um, what they say and what they do are two different things. Um, but what it comes down to is that relationship. And if you have a relationship with the leader where you feel confident, where you feel fulfilled, where you feel like you're part of the team, you're going to be more engaged. You're going to enjoy it more. And when you enjoy it more, you're going to put out better work. There are a lot of theories on leadership. You know, uh, and historically, um, there are, you know, if you were in this field, you know, 20 years ago, they had like the great man theory. And so, you know, somebody, you know, George Washington was born for the position to be the leader of, you know, independence and our first president. Um, yes and no. Uh, you know, I would argue that situations, you know, develop leaders and it's not just the, the individual, but it's an opportunity as well. Um, but they have a continuum of leadership from what Leos de Fair, the person that kind of lets you out there in the sports world. It's the coach that rolls out the ball and says, have at it, have fun. We'll see you later. Um, but it goes from the one that doesn't do much to the one uh, in an ideal world. It's the trans, uh, transformational leader. In a lot of activities, it's the leader that sees things in you that you don't see in yourself. Um, as an instructor or teacher, when I see things and opportunities or abilities in students that they don't see in themselves, and I help them, whether it's like find their voice or identify their strengths, uh, give them the confidence to try more things, you know, so that relationship becomes really important and you help the individual members grow and develop into their best possible selves. And if you have a group or organization that helps develop all the members to be better, you know, examples of themselves, you have a group that's going to be better and continue to develop and move to the future. 
So transformational leadership involves the actions that transcend the leader's own self-interest. A real good leader typically lets everybody else get the recognition. They're, they're not the ones that are stepping out in front and saying, look what I did. They're more likely to point at everybody else in their group and say, look what they did. Um, and from a military standpoint, typically the leader's the last one to eat. Uh, also, they don't necessarily lead the group into battle. Um, generally, like second or third is going to be out front and the leader is going to stay behind to make sure everything kind of gets done. So, but being a transformational leader becomes very important because you look towards the development and growth beyond where you are now so that everybody can be more fulfilled. Everybody can develop into something that they might not see themselves being there yet, uh, but helps them grow and develop. That makes us feel good, makes us feel competent, autonomous, related, and our intrinsic motivation goes up. Any questions so far? Come on, there's gotta be a question out there somewhere. Somebody's been part of a, a group and got, damn, this was dysfunctional, how can we fix it? Um, but again, happy to answer any questions you have. No, I, I can um, ask a question, Dr. Barba, okay. can you hear yeah. me? Um, yes. So you mentioned, uh, you know, how some folks are intrinsically uh, motivated through the mastery of a, of a skill set um, or a technique or whatnot. Do you find that more prevalent with one, let's just say like, I know you were talking about athletes, professional athletes, but like, do you see that also filtering into like a specific type of uh, workforce or the sector or of the economy? Um, or is that kind of just universal to like all sectors from your opinion? I would argue that we're, we're all performers. You know, whether it's, you know, me as a teacher interacting with my students, or if you're, you know, what you guys do with San Diego Military Family, where you're helping, you know, people step back into a society, you know, all these things have value. And, and so anytime, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, improving relationships or, heck, you know, being, you know, the best person with Zoom or, you know, you know all the simple activities we do, when we can, uh, you know, have those skills and be acknowledged by our group for those skills, um, it's going to increase our intrinsic motivation. I think this stuff crosses over for all activities. And anytime there's more than one person in the room, you're talking about leadership and growth and development. And, and so I think it's always important. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question, Daniel, but uh, yeah, that 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 was um, that was spot on. I have one uh, follow up and an audience. Once again, you can uh, you can raise your virtual hand when you have these questions. But, um, you know, some of the, the folks who are in this meeting may be supervisors. Um, any words of advice in terms of, you know, if, if you see that your staff members um, are intrinsically motivated in that particular way, what are you recommending? Are, are you recommending to like a, a supervisor to acknowledge maybe progress along the way? Or how do you, how do you uh, continue to kind of support or foster that environment? I think that's a great question. One benefit of having people that are intrinsically motivated, by definition, they don't need much. So acknowledging their success, what I always try to recommend is catching them doing the right thing. You know, catching them do those, the, doing those things, those little contributions that nobody might notice, um, always showing up on time. You know, the simple things um, that makes them successful and that you know, a lot of times people don't notice. Uh, and so I would always encourage to acknowledge those little things. Um, you know, my thing wouldn't be to focus on outcome but to focus on the process, focus on the hard work that they put in to get there, um, you know, focus on their ability to overcome difficulties, uh, you know, because we all have struggles in our life, but having somebody acknowledge that, that you know, that must have been tough and, you know, look where you are now, look what you've accomplished goes a long way. So, you know, you know, I might be dating myself here, but, you know, there's a lot of Eddie Haskells out there. 
where um, I don't know if anybody has the leave it to beaver thing there, but um, here you have a guy that when people are watching does the right thing. When they're not watching, he didn't. And so what I would always recommend is catch them doing the right thing when nobody else is watching and they're just doing it because they see value in it. It's important to them and catch them and say, you know, good job, way to go. We appreciate the hard work that you contribute and go, and again, focus on the process, the mastery, the development, uh, leave the outcome to all the hard work. Christine. Thank you. I, um, I work in an environment in a mental health clinic where all the clinicians are very isolated. They're in their offices with the doors shut, doing their, you know, their treatment, their therapy. And it's very, um, it's very infrequent that we get together. And so I'd love to hear from you or from the group of how to reach them um, while they're so isolated. And I think that is uh, a little bit of the nature of the business of what we do, but it's also a, a function of um, COVID where we just have been remote and getting back, you know, and that balance, you know, everyone now is talking about work-life balance and um, how to manage that. So I love everyone's feedback on how to reach people who are kind of by the nature of their work by themselves. Well, we'll all start with what I would offer was, you know, whether you can find, you know, some kind of just fun, you know, activity, whether it's whatever, 20 minutes. Um, I, I know we tried to put together, you know, silly, uh, you know, Zoom meetings where, and it, it, again, it wasn't the most beneficial just because of the distance that it offered, but just because we were, you know, everybody's been stuck in meetings like this for a long time. And instead of having a meeting where it's work, just whether it's fun, um, I attended a couple Zoom cocktail parties, uh, uh, Zoom, uh, they were you know, sharing recipes. Um, so we engage in activity that's kind of just enjoyable and fun. You know, how you draw them into that, that's a little harder. Um, you know, whether it's a potluck lunch or, or something like that. Because uh, I think a lot of times we, we try to make these, you know, big, huge things. And it's like just a simple, um, heck, you know, when somebody lets me out of a meeting five minutes early, I find some pleasure in that to be able to get outside and walk around or something. Um, you know, you know, so I, I, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think it has to be some grandiose idea. Um, but it, heck, you know, playing a Zoom bingo game at lunchtime or, or, or whatever, just some fun activity. Uh, so that you can share just being, you know, in the same building with each other or something like that, you know, might be a place that you start. I think a lot of times too, too often people think it needs to be some fancy big, no, and, you know, simple little things where you can just share, uh, be human together, uh, go a long way. Anyone else? I can share, this is Jennifer. Um, in previous places, we've had we've had like a day of the week where it was like a themed, um, like on every Wednesday it would be Wing Wednesday, and they had hot wings every day. We'd make hot wings in the office with somebody brought in an air fryer, and we just had different sauces, and we made. And every week we knew when we Wing Wednesday. Um, the other thing was like little cards, like note cards with positive affirmations or something that they. Uh, appreciated about that person, they'd leave it on their desk and they may have that, or they may give them out during a meeting. Um, just like uh, Dr. Barbara was saying, uh, small things, just little things it didn't have to be like major. Um, where we, where I worked, it was food was a really big thing. <laughs> uh, everybody enjoyed it and getting together and having like a potluck um, or like I said, like a themed event. I think there was another team that also um, worked on puzzles during their lunch break they all gathered in the lunchroom and worked on a puzzle every week or so after they finished. And then they just start a new one and they would just chat and, you know, talk about their lives while they were doing their puzzle. Thanks. And again, it doesn't have to be anything complicated, just simple, you know, get to know each other, humanity stuff goes a long way. 
one of the most successful youth coaches I ever ran into um, was a soccer coach for my older son. And at the end of every practice or at every game, she had put-ups. Um, and her perspective was they, a lot of times the kids would spend time putting each other down. And so she was conscientious about every day uh, they had, they put it put up. So it was kind of just acknowledging each other, what they did well together, you know, whether it was a friend or a smile or offering somebody a drink, a water, whatever it was, just those simple acknowledgements of, you know, you know, thanks for helping out or thanks for being a good teammate or friend uh, goes a long way. I, I don't think we acknowledge, you know, our interactions as much as we should and, and the inherent value uh, you know, what, I think we try to pretend like we're no, not social animals, but we really are. And those relationships and those meetings and those friendships, uh, you know, the, they're at the heart of what kind of give our, ourselves value. Um, okay, so has uh, anybody else got anything to add? Okay, so moving on. Um, we talked about the, uh, the idea Nichols, you know, was looking at our feelings of confidence, you know, how, how we felt confident in our environment and looked at whether they were self-referenced or referenced, you know, outside of self. Um, when we are chasing someone else's perspective of what we should be or what life should be, it's going to be impossible to ever achieve it. And so I always try to have self-reference norms or, you know, I want to be a better Doug than I was yesterday, not mm, Tony Robbins, uh, you know, or whatever. I want to be self-referenced as though so my success and my failure has to do with my ability to get the job done. It, it's not relying on any outside source. It, it has nothing to do with luck. It's whether Doug decides to do it and gets it done. And in that way, my success is under my control as opposed to leaving it to luck, uh, the weather, or somebody else's contribution. And that becomes very important. Now, um, a lot of you have probably heard of Growth Mindset. Uh, Carol Dweck wrote the book, I want to say 2007. Um, she had a long research kind of portfolio before that. It started with the whole idea of being incremental or entities. Uh, incremental people were just always in development, always able to get better. We could grow and we could learn skills. Uh, we could you know, improve our kind of place in the world. Uh, the entity theor theory was more that we are where we're born. It's kind of, we're stuck, we're stagnant, we can't get better. Uh, you know, you, you are the lot in life. Um, and what I would argue, is know that we are you know, able to grow, we are able to learn new things. And so I always like the incremental perspective. Okay, and so when she came out with the growth and fixed mindset, it's just an extension of that. Either you think that you know, there is no more value in education, I can't learn new things, I can't get better at things, I am stuck with what I'm at. Um, and the growth mindset was like, oh yes, I can learn and I can grow and I can you know, get better. What we are is kind of a combination of both. There's going to be situations where I want to learn, I want to get better, and there's other times when I'm hyper confident. I think I'm all I need to be, and so um, having a little mix of both is always good. Uh, Carol Dweck had kind of pushed that you know growth mindset was all of it. Um, more recently, researchers have come up to question that, and you kind of need a little uh, of both, and that kind of is an extension of kind of ego and task. Uh, orientation and we'll kind of touch on that quickly as well. Any other questions? Okay, taking a deeper dive on the whole idea of self-determination theory. And so their whole thing was whether, you know, you could improve or, you know, feelings of autonomy, my ability to be an effective agent in my environment, to get things done, to be productive in my environment, huge uh, benefit. Um, and so, you know, as humans are proactive, we're self-motivated and actively seek optimal challenges in our environment. And so we want to be agents of change. We want to be in control of our destiny and it just goes a long way. And so if you can, you know, fulfill those needs in your employees or the people that you work with, then they're gonna, you know, get 
they're going to be more effective in their roles. They're going to be more efficient. They're going to be more resilient, and they're going to be intrinsically motivated. Um, optimal engagement, wellness, development, and growth. So you're giving them a chance to, you know, influence their environment, get better at it, and also be recognized for that development and growth. Three basic needs, competence, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Are we picking to choose this? I want to, yeah, Rod, go ahead. So I had to unmute my mic here. I appreciate this part about autonomy uh, because more and more I'm seeing that there is an, like across all sectors, there's a culture of permission getters rather than decision makers. Could you speak to that with respect to the, your, this autonomy that you're talking about? Well, to me, that sounds like you're getting your hand slapped for putting it in the cookie jar. Um, you know, one thing I always encourage when you're talking about developing a motivational climate or, 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 or room to grow and develop is acknowledge that there's going to be obstacles, there's going to be failure. Um, I think a lot of times now in our society, we want to protect everybody from all the harsh reality. Um, but guess what? Life can be harsh reality. And so having an appreciation that there's going to be struggle um, and that you can be successful and intentional and in moving beyond it uh, so that you select activities that are hard um, goes a long way. If you're always worried about, well, if I do that, somebody's going to get mad at me. I think you're losing your autonomy. You're giving up control to an outside source. And so that is not going to be an effective way to be a leader or kind of run a motivational or, or run a group in general. Does that kind of touch on it, Ron? It does a little bit, but I'm thinking with respect to people say, well, I, it's not my decision. I, you know, I can't, it's almost like a way of getting out of taking action on things saying, well, I got to refer this up. And, and the, the whole climate is, is people saying, well, I'm not that I'm way down in the chain. And uh, I think they're trying to mitigate their responsibilities to take action, maybe fearful. It's not my job. I just, uh, we have this real clear thing and you can't step out of line. And I see that more and more in, in, in all organizations, nonprofits and for-profits. And I just, this, this idea of autonomy is something that seems like it's, it's, I don't know that it's frowned upon, but it seems at least by culture discouraged. Uh, I would agree. And I would argue that that's a fixed mindset perspective where it's like, you know, these are the rules, this is how we follow them. Um, and what, what that does, it stifles any curiosity, um, any imaginative uh, other outcomes or options. Um, and to me, it, you're setting up an environment where failure is not an option. And to get better and expand uh, failure needs to be an option. We have to try things that are out of our comfort zone that aren't necessarily the norm because that might be a better way. Um, if the only way is the old way, guess what? You're doing the old way. Um, I can't tell you how many coaches I run into. It's like, well, in the 1960s, when I was an athlete, you know, coaches used to scream at us and all this stuff. And it's like, okay, that's great. Guess what? We know better. You know, if the U.S. military, which is the number one employer for mental performance consultants, why? Because there's a benefit of intrinsic motivated, intrinsically motivated people. Um, they get more done. They're more resilient. So if you're in an organization that has a set, you know, fixed set of rules, and that's the only way that things work, it's not going to be developing. It's not going to be growing. It's not going to be expanding because it's set under, you know, the, the, the rules and regulations that were put together, whatever, decades ago or whatever, and, and they don't see any process to move beyond that. And so I would always encourage kind of, you know, it's kind of like where I started with, like, I want to know your questions because I can talk at you forever on these topics, 
But for us to get something out of it, you know, there needs to be reciprocity. There needs to be an exchange of communication and not me just feeling at it. Because what does that do to your autonomy if I'm the only one talking? But yeah. And so I, I agree with you, Ron. Uh, I think a lot of times, and I've seen coaches that want to see perfect practices. And I think that's a joke because I've never seen a perfect competition. Um, and, and what we need to do is kind of embrace the struggle, acknowledge it's part of it. And I think we need to charge people to see things in a different light so we get different solutions to the problems that we haven't been able to solve yet. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate your comments on that because I, I really see that uh, we, when we send people out as representatives of our organizations, where I'm with the San Diego Veterans Coalition, uh, a very similar environment to San Diego Military Family Collaborative, that we're relying on the people from other organizations to to kind of decide and act or uh, or get information to decide and act. And so this idea, uh, we do a thing called shout outs uh, where different members get to shout out when somebody did something really good for their organization uh, with that, with the idea of, of developing intrinsic motivation. Uh, I agree that there's, especially in a volunteer that you can't pay people. So, so that's almost all got to be intrinsic motivation. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Jessica. Hello, good morning. Would you qualify motivation as a feeling or emotion or a state of being? Hmm. Well, it's transient. So it, I, I guess the state of being, um, but I also know that kind of emotion can bolster it. Uh, so, so I think I, I would go with, uh, uh, I, I would go with the trait. But yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> no, we got to blot out that part of the recording. But no, um, yeah, because, but I, but I also know it can be manipulated or leveraged. Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I've, I've never thought of it from that perspective. Ron, do you have another one or are hands still up from the last one? It was still up from last time. I'll take it down. No, no worries. Um, but okay, so, you know, anytime, if you're in a group, if you can foster autonomy, competence, and relatedness, it's going to go a long way. Um, like, I think, you know, Ron made a really good point. These are nonprofits. The, the people that are you're working with they, you really need to help them lock into the why. You need to help them see the benefit that they're offering, the greater society, you know, move beyond just that simple satisfaction of, well, I helped this one person. It's like, no, you're helping the whole society. You're, you're, you're facilitating, you know, growth and development, you know, reinterjection to our community for these people that stood up for us and stood on the front lines to support us. And so at the very least, we should do a better job of helping them out. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I can't think of a more valuable uh, and beneficial organization than what you do. Um, and, and so helping them, you know, identify their why, develop their why. Of, OK, so what's the value to me? It's like, you know, helping somebody, you know, find, you know, their new life, the back end of it or whatever. And I think there's, you know, a lot of value there. Vic. Dr. Barbara, oh, oh. I was just going to say. <laughs> Please go ahead. I was just going to say, we have a question um, from Vic, so he, yeah. he caught it. Oh, okay. All right. I needed that introduction. Um, thank you, Dr. Barbara, for sharing all of this. Um, in relation to an SD, or excuse me, to a nonprofit where, um, you know, where the motivation really has to be uh, uh, very prominent because you, you have to be able to get people engaged. One thing that I've noticed is the more that someone is knowledgeable about the mission and vision of the organization and sort of have that ownership of the message, uh, the more they're willing to, or the more they're 
um, motivated to sort of uh, be a part of that team. And, and I reflect back on my time in the military where um, we're given uh, general orders, which are the basic rules of being a, a soldier, a sailor, airman, whatever you may be. Um, and, and one of those um, general orders is to take ownership of every government piece of property in view um, while you're on watch. And, and I think that level of ownership gives a lot of lower enlisted folks in the military that opportunity to feel engaged in a part of the team and so forth. And I'm certain that that probably carries on into the civilian sector as well. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things that gets in the way in the military, you know what your job is. You, you know how you're going to be held accountable. You know what you're responsible for. Um, in civilian life, it's not that clean. It's, it's just not that clear. And so helping people engage in why they do things and having ownership, like you say, of their kind of values and mission. Uh, you know, I can't agree with you more as far as the value in that, because that gives you autonomy because they get to decide whether they want to engage in it competence because you know where the hell you're going and relatedness because you're part of a group that's you know that is their purpose and that is their mission and, and anytime you know if you go into a room of strangers there's one feeling if you go into a room of people that have the same value the same you know passion and mission as you do i would argue that room is totally different um, it's a place where you feel comfortable, you feel engaged, you want to share. And so, you know, anytime you can do that with a group or organization, uh, you just, you're going to get more effective and efficient, you know, work or value. And I, I you know, it's like when you, you know, for me, um, you know, every year I, I'll go to a conference and I get that feeling when you're in a room with all the, you know, the people that believe this, they're drinking the same Kool-Aid. And so it's like, oh, you know, there's, as opposed to going in with a bunch of strangers that you don't know their di direction, their passion uh, makes a big difference. Wendy. Hi, so I just wanted to add on my own experience. There was, um, there was I worked for a university for some time and um, there were times where my director would ask me to do things like, for example, hey, can you make a flyer for whatever upcoming event? And I'll be like, okay, like, how do you want it? What do you want it to look like? What, do you, what does it need to include? And she's like, oh, do whatever you want. You're very creative. Just do whatever you want. So then I would come up with something and then it wouldn't be good. And then she'd be like, well, let's just switch this. And then the end result was that I, I barely did anything. So it was like, she basically did everything herself. So I kind of felt like, now, what am I doing? You know, so that autonomy wasn't like it kind of, I had an illusion of autonomy, but it really wasn't. And that was very demotivating. So although she was really good in many other um, aspects of her leadership, um, it was just this, like, just give me a little, give me a little room, you know? And um, again, it was, it, I found it very difficult to work that way. Um, but um that that you know, if you can avoid that, yeah, that that would be great for for leaders out there. You know. Thanks, Wendy. Well, even in that example, if they had given you a little more direction or like what they were looking for, you know, goes a long way. Um, you know, a, a lot of coaches, a lot of leaders have trouble giving their employees autonomy because it, it's, it's essentially they don't trust the direction they're going to take it. So I always encourage them, well, then give them options that you're comfortable with. Give them options that you're willing to, to, to abide by. Because the worst thing you can do is kind of direct them and then say, no, 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 that's not the way we got to go. We got to go this way. And so, you know, if they provide you options, you know, in, in Wendy's case, maybe if they offered, well, we could do this way or this way or this way, you pick. And so that way the leader knows, okay, there's three directions that she, she can go. I'm comfortable with all of them. Whatever she does will be okay is way different than going, yeah, I'm comfortable, do it. And they're like, no, 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 that's not what we're looking for. And so a little direction goes a long way. And I think a lot of times they'll get in the direction you want them to go if you offer them options in those directions and, and you can set them loose. And that way you give them the autonomy to make their own decision. 
um, they're going to feel more related to the group because they're participating at a higher level. And then once it's accepted, you're like, look, I'm good at this. This makes me feel good. I'm confident. You know, let me do more. Vic, you got another one for us? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, taking up all the time and, and, and comments, but one more thing about that, uh, about that, what you were just chatting about is in the military, you would stand at eight o'clock in the morning, you'd all stand in line and, you know, somebody would come up and tell you everything that was wrong with you, <laughs> you know, what was wrong with your uniform, what you needed to fix, what you didn't look good, if you had a weird hair sticking out of your face, all of those things were addressed. And that never happens in the civilian sector. And so even as leaders, we don't have um, that sort of, um, I don't know that we are, uh, there's a level of communication where things could be improved and, and not be taken so emotional and just be taken as a form of an improvement in leadership style. Is there a way that you've noticed that that can be negotiated in a civilian world? I would argue, kind of, if you set those standards from the onset, if you talk about, you know, expectations of roles, you know, before people come in, you know, this is what we would have you do. This is how we're going to, you know, account for it or, or hold you responsible for it. And so all those rules are set in advance. You know, one of the most important things we can do in a group is communicate effectively. And that can be really hard because it's not what I say, it's what you hear. And so being uh, competent enough or confident enough to kind of be able to listen and take what people give you and come out to a response that's effective and, and beneficial for both people and doesn't necessarily just protect the ego of the leader goes a real long way. Um, but, you know, setting those standards, you know, as early on in the relationship, the expectation, um, th I think those are critical. Uh, and I think that those go a long way. I hope that helps a little. Anything else? To be honest, I'm not having, I don't know how many more slides we got. <laughs> Okay, so these are the different theories. So uh, self-determination theory is a meta theory. Uh, this was where they started. And ever since then, they've expanded to go on, you know, six different theories. And they're just looking at more specific perspectives of the whole autonomy, competence, and related thing. Uh, whether it's, you know, the social factors of it, the context of the situation, um, whether you're, you know, you see yourself as being integral, uh, a causal agent in your environment. Um, you know, our basic needs of autonomy, competence, and relatedness, goal theories. What kind of goals do you set? Do you set goals that are focused on outcome or do you uh, set goals that are focused on process? If you're setting goals focused on outcome, you're going to have trouble because they're more ego oriented. And so you're going to do things that protect your ego as opposed to work to develop an outcome. Um, you know, what you want to focus on is process and it's going to be self-relevant or self-norm. Uh, so I want to get better at what I'm doing today. I'm not comparing myself to Wendy or Vic or Claudine or anybody. It's like, can Doug do a better job than Doug did yesterday? And that way it's always under my control. Um, and and uh, relationship motivation theory is back to the social thing. How we, what we get from each other in our communications, Reinforcement just goes a long way in our willingness to participate, our willingness to invest in groups. Okay, here's another uh, a busy one. On the left-hand uh, side of the screen is a motivation. These people are the ones that are sitting on the couch. They have no intention of getting out of the couch. They are stuck on the couch. Uh, on the whole uh, way on the right side is intrinsically motivated people. They don't need any direction necessarily. They're going to do the behavior or not. They, you know, they do it because it makes them feel good. It makes them feel fulfilled. And what you have in the middle is, you know, the role of extrinsic motivators. Um, there are times, like if my kid is playing out in the street, you know, how am I going? You know, obviously, he's intrinsically motivated to lay out. This is a true story about my childhood. Um, 
uh, there used to be a game in the, where you'd run out in the middle of the street and lay down on the street. Yeah, it was a real good game. Um, you, you welcome to the 1960s. It was a great idea until the car I jumped in front of was my father. Um, so, you know, I, I was in, it was like a fun thing to go out there. I didn't understand all the dangers involved and all of that stuff. But once I integrated his perspective, hey, knucklehead, you lay out on the street, there's cars in the street. Um, you, you might want to re you know, reevaluate this game. Um, and, and so all of a sudden, going from thinking laying in the street's a good idea to starting understanding all the trouble that you get in out in the middle of the street. So I was able to internalize that you know, motivation, that reasoning. And so Doug doesn't lay out in the street anymore. Um, you know, obviously that, that's a bizarre example of it. But what happens is, you know, when we use extrinsic stuff, when we use uh, candy, pizza parties, all of this stuff uh, to um, hopefully, you know, guarantee some type of behavior, what happens when the extrinsic motivation leaves? How many of you are at a job that if they stop paying you, you would continue to do it? Right? And so somewhere along the line, if you can turn that extrinsic motivation into intrinsic motivation, all of us have activities that we do because we're good at them. They give us fulfillment. Uh, they help us feel good about ourselves, be part of a group. Those are the behaviors we're going to do no matter what, because we're they're self-driven, they're intrinsic, they're at the heart. Um, I will exercise. I will try to always be uh, good to my wife and my kids. I want to be a better husband than I was yesterday. Those are the things that are intrinsic in my heart to get better at. And so those are the things I will always work on. I don't have to be paid. Um, I imagine there's some compensation of the relatedness with my wife and all that stuff. But again, I, I, you know, that's how I'm reinforced is I feel good about it. I make my bed every morning. How come? Because I like getting in a freshly made bed at night, um, not because I'm getting paid for it or anything like that. So finding those things uh, that motivate us no matter what that we do because we like them and they feel good, those are all on the right hand side. And that we want to move the behaviors that are on the left side further to the right because they're going to be more persistent in the, in the light of difficulties and uh, you're going to be better at them. Uh, autonomy. Induced internal pressure and sanctions such as guilt or shame. Uh, a lot of parents, when they pick their kids up from youth sport, what's the first question? Did you win? What kind of goal is that, right? So we're locking, we put them in an outcome-oriented belief from when they're six years old. Did you win? Guess what? The kids aren't keeping score. The kids aren't keeping score until they're like nine, 10, Unless you're a six-year-old and every time your parents start with, did you win? Guess what the kid's going to be paying attention next time they play? Whether they win or not. If the outcome is the only successful, you know, winning or losing or winning is the only successful outcome, what are you willing to do to get there? If, you know, being rich is your only successful outcome, what are people willing to do in our society to do that? I would argue lie, cheat, and steal. And that's not good for anybody else in the, in the culture. And so when we focus on outcome, right, it comes to a point where whatever means we need to get to that end, we do. And I would argue that's not in our, that's not in our self-interest. Our self-interest as humanity lies in being more mastery process oriented. Hey, did you have fun? Would be a better place to start with your kid. Are you willing to come back? Um, you know, one story I offer like on the Little League side, uh, when my kids went through Little League, the Little League had, I think 10 teams of kids like six and under. 
By the time they got to 12 year olds, they had one team. And they're telling me that they're running a successful baseball organization. I'm going, no, you don't. If you have whatever, you only have like 10% of the athletes stay on for a few years, that's not success. That's failure. You know, sport, those, that participation at a young age should be all about having fun and developing kind of some motor skills. It shouldn't be focused on outcome. You know, if you have a little league coach or anybody coming in there and saying, well, we've won the championship the last, you know, I don't know that anybody cares how successful you are at, you know, San Carlos Little League. I, I've never seen anybody that was interested. And so, you know, how do we focus on task orientation, mastery as opposed to outcome? And these are just examples of, you know, the discussion you can have from a supportive perspective of intrinsic motivation or the things that you can say that get in the way of intrinsic motivation. Task orientation, focused on meaning, task demands, improvement and effort. It's not about winning. A lot of toxic stuff happens when you focus on winning. Reflect self-comparison, self-reference comparison. Again, it's like, am I better than I was yesterday? I'm not comparing myself to Manny Machado or Fernando Tatis. It's like, is Doug better today than yesterday? If you're task oriented, if you have an appreciation for that, you're gonna be engaged in it. You're, you're gonna do it because there's gonna be maximal effort. Um, you're choosing to do it. It's self-reference. You're choosing because you want it. It's not because, you know, you, you know whatever, your parents said you had to do it or even your friends are doing it. So you wanna do it. Wendy, you have a question. Do you have any advice or recommendations for those people that are motivated, like comparing themselves to professional athletes? How would you say, how would you advise them to be in competition with themselves versus a professional? Is there, is there anything? Well, I, I think one way I, I always recommend that you try to set it in terms of controllability. Right. You know, what's under your control? You know, how can you get a benefit? If I'm worried about myself compared to, you know, some elite athlete, you know, that's not realistic for one thing. Uh, and helping them identify, OK, so what's under your control? You know, one thing is that, you know, I'm not a full blown adult yet or, or you know, I'm not the same size as LeBron James or Michael Jordan or, or whatever. I don't have those physical attributes. And so helping them identify the things that they are good at and reinforcing those might be a really good place to start. And so that they can acknowledge their own success and then, and then help them identify, well, how can you even get better at that as opposed to how can you get, you know, LeBron James good at that um, might be a good way. The other reality is all of us have both. All of us have ego. All of us have some tasks. Uh, what you want to do is kind of crank up the task and try to alleviate some of that ego. Does that sort of answer? Yes, thank you. Um, for me, the biggest thing <clears throat> is down there. Oh, excuse me. Ah, this is what happens when I scream at my video screen all day. But persisting through difficulty. You know, that that's what I want people to learn. That's what I want people to do. If there was one thing I wanted my kids, well, maybe two, I wanted my kids to know that I love them and I wanted my kids to know that they could get through tough things. Because when you do that, you know, everything's an opportunity. You know, if you know you're good through the hard stuff, then the easy stuff by definition is easy, right? So when I'm working with athletes or teams, I encourage them to go find the, the most distasteful stuff in their life and attack it. You know, the hardest stuff and attack it, right? If, if you can do that, then the, the, the fun stuff, the easy stuff, it is easy to give full out effort. If you know you can do the hard stuff, the easy stuff, it just gets easier. And so, you know, persisting through those difficult and failure, you know, that's what we're looking for. 
And that's what always scares me about coaches that, you know, push for the perfect practice or, or don't make mistakes. No, I want to see you make mistakes. I want to be there so we can talk through it. We can get through that. And so there's more success in the future. You know, I wanted my kids to be a knucklehead in front of me. I didn't want them pretending like everything's perfect and being a knucklehead in society. It's like, show me your stupid stuff now. We can smooth out those edges and you're going to be safe out, outside. And, and, you know, that's my own quirky you know, parenthood. But, yeah, that's part of it. But, and it also, it, if you're intrinsically motivated on this task, you know what to do and you're going to continue to work on it. You're going to continue to improve because that's what you want to do. You want to be good at it. Ego, demonstrating superior competence, normative comparison. I am better than you. You know, just when I say that, what does it do to you? Do you like, oh, I, I, when I say it, I'm offended. For one thing, I don't know all of you to know anything like that. Right? But, but again, it puts you in a position where instead of getting better at something, you're more interested in being better than that one person or somebody. And so that perspective changes the whole kind of relatedness relationship. And it also takes it out of your control. What happens on the athletic side when somebody's just better? You know, because they're, sometimes you're going to lose because the other guys are trying just as hard and maybe that day they're better. And the same thing happens in the business world. You can come in there, you can have the best plan, sometimes it doesn't work out. And so for me, it's like, okay, so what do you do with that? You know, how do you handle your success and how do you handle your failure will tell me a lot about, you know, how this organization, this culture, this team is going to continue to work. Because if you show me you can handle the, the failure and the difficulty, then you're, I see you're going to be more successful if you have good coaching or good leadership. Feel most confident when they show they are better than others, opponents or teammates. Don't you want to be part of that group? I don't. It's maladaptive, holding back effort and training or competition. They will make themselves look less effective so that they can participate or compete against people of lower skill so that success is guaranteed. That, there's, there's no benefit. There's no growth or development. If you're only looking for to pull the low-hanging fruit, then guess what you get? Low-hanging fruit. You don't get the successful, you don't get the orange at the top of the tree. Uh, and, and we need to kind of strive beyond the simple and easy because the things that you're asking, you know, you, the members to do can be hard. How do you help them overcome those struggles? And the other thing that happens if you are ego oriented and there's failure, you stop, you quit, you pack it in. And I don't think any of us want those kind of people. We want people that are going to see difficulty and stick their nose in it. We don't want people that, oh, it gets tough. I'm going to go a different direction. Those aren't people that are going to help you. We have both. There are situations where I'm very egotistical. Luckily, probably the last 30 years of my life, I've worked hard to be less. As an old, I was an old baseball pitcher. And so I, you, I had to have some ego to sit on that mound and say, everybody look at me, watch what I'm going to do to this guy. But I also had to have some mastery and tasks because I had to be good at my task. I had to be able to, just on some level, throw it where I wanted, or I wasn't going to be effective. And so, you know, we have parts of both. And all I would recommend is try to increase task orientation, because that's going to get you better at the task. And if you're better at the task, you, the outcome is more likely. Not guaranteed, never guaranteed. Um, how many of you watch football? 
If you watch football, I can't encourage you enough to look into Jalen Hurts. So Jalen Hurts, quarterback, uh, he played at Alabama. <clears throat> they, I think they had an undefeated season, and their coach had uh, the guts to sit him down at halftime in the national championship game. You know what Jalen did? He stood on the stand and he was clapping for his teammates. His, he, the man doesn't have an ego. He just works hard. The team went on to win the national championship. The following year, the other quarterback gets hurt. Jalen goes back in and wins them a national championship again. The only way you can do that is if your focus is on the outcome for the whole team. Right? If this gentleman had ego orientation, as soon as his coach pulled in, he would have jumped in the transfer portal and gotten the hell out of Alabama. Now, we can all joke that that's probably a good idea, but he didn't. He chose not to. Even in his professional career, he bounced around a little while. Uh, Philadelphia finally gave him an option to actually play, and they got to the Super Bowl. And if not for Patrick Mahomes, they would have won it. But so, you know, having people that are, you know, task oriented, intrinsically motivated, just helps the organization, the culture, all of it to a better outcome. And so that brings us to the whole idea of having a motivational climate. So you're going to, you know, you're going to be really specific about people's responsibilities and expectations and accountability. So they know what the rules are. They know, you know what their job is. They know if they do it right, they're going to be acknowledged. How many of you have done something successful for your group? And guess what the leader does? Stands up in front and said, look what I did. How'd that make you feel, right? It's just like, hey, boss, I did that. It's kind of like when you go to graduate school, and you do all the work for a paper, and the first author is the person that didn't do anything. Yeah. That's a whole nother story. Um, sources of authority. Who determines what's good or bad? Again, being a leader means, okay, we want to see you in the most difficult situations. You know, How do you respond? How do you come back to it? How do you keep trying? And that is going to be if you are focusing on improving their autonomy, their confidence, and their relatedness. If you nurture those things, they're going to be better teammates, workmates. They're going to be more intrinsically motivated. They're going to be there because they want to be there, not because you're you know, reinforcing it with some other thing. And it's just going to be a better environment. If you're a leader, you know, the people on the other side, you, your followers or your members, they want to know that they matter. They want to know that they're important to that group. They want to know that the things that they do make a difference. Right? And we all want to belong. We all want to be part of whatever a tribe, a team, whatever it is, a culture, a family. And when you can do those things, people are just more responsible, accountable. Um, they're better teammates. Uh, they're better participants. Um, and, and they're role models for everybody else in the group. And when you get into a high-functioning group, it's hard to be the bad apple because there's no place for you. And so I can't encourage you enough to kind of really focus on, you know, helping the members of your groups, you know, have, you know, direction in the outcome. You know, being confident of the skills and acknowledging them. And then, you know, related to the group, thanks for coming. I appreciate, you know, just all of you being willing to give up an hour, hour and a half to some knucklehead from National University to help you kind of run more high functioning groups. You know, I, I can't thank you enough because, uh, again, I think what you do is incredibly valuable. You know, like, you know, we do a whole lot to, you know, the military does a whole lot to prepare you for war. 
they don't do a darn thing really to prepare you for society afterward. And I think it's a mistake. I think it's a shortcoming. And I want to thank all of you for participating to make it better on the back end for all of those people that are willing to give up their lives for the rest of us. I thank you for your time. I thanks for your participation. If you have any questions or comments, be happy to answer them. Um, my email address is dbarba at nu.edu. If you have questions, comments, I'm uh, happy to address them. Thanks for your time. And thank you again, Dr. Barba. Um, I think the I can just attest for myself to say definitely thinking about different approaches in, in my own uh, work. Um, so I'm going to take over the screen sharing um, with regard to uh, the, the remaining time that we have. I just just uh, once again, if you have a question for Dr. Barba, it's now or never. So welcome to provide that. If not, you can always uh, get back with his um <clears throat> with his email um and then you know once again wanted to thank all of you community members for being here today um with the time that we have remaining there's a little bit of time if you have a quick elevator pitch about what's happening in your neck of the woods uh for april coming around the corner or anything sooner uh welcome to to share uh, just unmute yourself I, I can call on a few of you so ron you want to start the the, the train I'll sure do that. Our uh, coalition meeting uh, is the first Friday of each month, 8.30 to 10.30. Doctor, you're welcome to join us. Uh, we are, uh, I mean, SD, we're a member of SD Military Family Collaborative and they're a member of us. And we are responding to this thing. Uh, the military does a good job of transitioning people in, integrating and transitioning out. Uh, the VA and the Department of Labor are enrolling people into benefits and health care and workforce, et cetera. Uh, we're working on a project now so that uh, for the reintegration into the community after the military. Uh, and so uh, if you'd like to hear more about that, 619-339-6092, 619-339-6092. And sdvetscoalition.org at the bottom of the page is our uh, information to join either in person or uh, or hybrid uh, virtually. So we run a hybrid meeting. Uh, doctors, we're really glad to hear you listen in, and then maybe you can give us some perspective of what ways we might be able to improve. So. All right. Thank you for that. I'm gonna say any last takers. Going once. Oh, yeah, can I can I jump in, guys? It's Christine. It. Um, Cohen Veterans Clinics is hosting a drive-through children's um, month of the military child. It's going to be in San Diego, April 21st at National University parking lot. Thank you, Jennifer Santis. Um, and the one in Oceanside is going to happen at our clinic up on Ocean Ranch Road. I will send the flyer to Danny. Um, there's links that you can send to your network of people uh, for people to register it's for veterans and active duty families. Um, and then there's another one I can uh, attach. It's got a QR code on it. So people can just snap that and register. In San Diego, we have room for 250 people. And in Oceanside, uh, we have 150 slots. And those are families. So thanks so much. Great. Last couple. Anyone else? Okay. Um, I just wanted to once again thank everyone for showing up today. As you saw in the chat, I'm throwing just one last uh, call to have you take a post survey. The post survey is important for us this year because we want to actually, you know, make sure that you feel like your voice has been heard. Uh, when it comes to planning for our subject matter experts like Dr. Barba, um, when it comes to our uh, next upcoming um, training or networking, that will be in June. So we're we're looking at the third month of every quarter uh, for our our members only events and activities. So it should likely be around the same time towards the end of June. There's some um, right now some back end work by our coordinating council to help support uh potential training topics and that might be including things like uh equity diversity inclusion 
that might be uh, related to uh, communication slash conflict uh, management. Um, but we wanna know what you want to know about uh, capacity building and leadership training for you know, all levels of your teams, whether they're frontline staff or executives. So please take a moment, fill out the um, survey. It's really brief, um, but yeah, just wanted to once again, thank you all for your membership. And when it comes to today, I mean, uh, I hope you've gathered some, some more knowledge base uh, there and um, we'll see you next quarter, which will be once again in June. And let's not forget, April is month of the military child. So let's try to all pay it forward and uh, connect and cultivate and uh, support some of our local schools, some of our local students who are doing some tremendous work in this place and space. So uh, on behalf of myself and the coordinating council for STMFC, we appreciate you and hope that you have a great close to your day. Take care, everyone. That's a wrap.